It is with uh, great privilege and pleasure that I do stand behind this pulpit this morning to proclaim God's word. But it is also with great trepidation as well. Um, I've raised four children, and I have, I don't know, 14, 15 grandchildren. And uh, you would think that this message might be an easy message for me, but it's probably one of the hardest messages I've ever prepared. Because I realize how, as I look back, and as I've gone through Scripture, areas that I've failed. But I'm so grateful to God for His Holy Spirit and for His forgiveness that he does forgive us and he cleanses us and he gives us the strength to continue on in his word. This morning we desire to hold forth his word before us today as we talk about God's, the biblical role of raising our children. You know, we probably have all heard of the experiment of placing a frog in cool water on the top of a stove and then slowly turning up the heat. Because the rising of the heat is so gradual that the frog remains in the pan as the water begins to boil. The frog adjusts to the heat and what happens? it eventually boils to death. This process illustrates to you and I this morning what has happened to many American families and even Christian families today. Cameron and I have uh, been making this point clear each of the past three weeks about the changes in our society and in our culture that have been so gradual over the past 50 or 60 years that I can recall that many have hardly noticed. Each small change in standards and in our values seems insignificant, doesn't it, of itself. But it is so gradual that the danger is not even noticed even when the family starts to disintegrate or it starts to crumble and eventually falls apart. Does this sound familiar? Maybe too close home, doesn't it? When the divorce rate among Christian couples is almost as high as it is with unbelievers, it is clear that many believers should have jumped out of the pan long ago. It is high time that we begin to look to the Word of God for our direction and our counsel. Instead of looking to our culture and our own opinions, let's look to the Word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 reads that the Lord our God is our God. The Lord is one. And he says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. This message was given to Israel that they were to take for herself and pass it on. And it's for you and I today, we're to take this word of God and pass it on. The first step uh, to pr promoting God's truth is to pass it on to our children. And you shall teach them dilig diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, verse 7, parents, you are to continually 
Speak of the things of God to your children. So learning to love Him would become a matter of life and breath to them. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontals on your forehead. Verse 8. Even when the parents are gone, the testimony remained, because why? It was written on the doorposts of your house and in your gates. Verse 9. If God's plan for His Word is to be passed on from one generation to the next generation, then God's primary agents are to whom? Parents. You parents. Many conflicts could be eliminated completely if we as Christian couples would make the Bible our final authority in raising our children. God who is our creator and the creator of our children knows all things. And he has given us his word for clear direction concerning parental guidelines, hasn't he? It's all written here for us. The scriptures give us basic standards and goals. And we do not have to shoot from the hip, so to speak. We have the written word of God the infallible Word of God, to answer every question, settle any dispute, and to be our final authority in rearing our children. One of the most profound and instructive and helpful verses I feel in all Scripture on raising children is in our text in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And we'll read this verse together, and then we're going to go to prayer, because we need help here. Chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you, Lord, in weakness, relying completely upon you, Father, because without you, I am nothing. I have nothing to offer. It is only through the power of your Holy Spirit and from your word that we can claim victory. And Father, we're so thankful this morning that we can go to your word, the very infallible, authoritative word of God for our direction, for our guide, for our counsel. And I would pray this morning that you would be with every parent here this morning, everyone, those who are not parents, those who are young, who are maybe in their teenage years or, or beyond, or those who are single, those who are grandparents. We all need this word, Father. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to see some of the illustrations and the applications that we maybe have learned over our lifetime from God's word that we can Help teach others. Father, what a blessing it is to parent children. They're the most wonderful of blessings that we have on this earth. That we can teach them, we can instruct them, we can discipline them so they can come to know Christ. Oh, Father, strengthen me this day. I thank you for what you will do because I'm trusting in you and you alone. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that does not know you as Savior, 
I pray, dear God, that today that you might draw them to yourself with the efficacious call. Those who you have divinely called from the foundation of the world, that this might be the day that they would come and accept you as Lord and Savior of their heart and life. Father, strengthen us all this morning to hear your word. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In this verse, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, God says, Fathers, do not provoke or exasperate your children to anger or to wrath, but bring them up in the discipline or training or admonition and instruction or nurture or counsel of the Lord, depending on which translation you might be reading. Fathers, do not provoke your children, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. I would suggest that if you understand and apply these simple principles of this verse, that you will find success and much joy in the raising of your children. Is it going to be easy? No. Will you make mistakes? Yes. Many of them. As I look back, like I said, we've made mistakes. But you know, if we would have always raised our children according to God's word, what much we would have had such a much more success and blessing. But as we look at our first principle, we see it is particularly directed to fathers. Why? Probably uh, during uh, their culture, that the father was the most dominant figure in the households of that day, and he was the one who would most often provoke his children to anger through discipline. But as script as we compare Scripture with Scripture, it indicates that the mother also should be involved in the raising of your children. Exodus 20, verse 12 says, and Ephesians 6, 2, commands children to honor who? Their father and their mothers. Fathers and mothers. Proverbs 1, 8 says, my son... Hear the instruction of your father and forsake not the law of your mother. In Proverbs 6.20, almost identical verse, says basically the same thing. Instead of the instruction, it says, hear the commandments of your father and the law of your mother. And 1 Timothy 5.10 says that women who have brought up children are due special treatment when they are widowed and over 60 years of age. So we see here, women brought up children. And in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, says that women, the older women should teach the younger women to be chaste keepers at home, to love their husbands and their children, and so on. The Bible teaches that women not only may, but they must be involved in raising children. The children, also mothers, you are to nurture and to care for your own little ones at home. When your children are toddlers, don't, I know in this culture, this uh, is not popular, but don't leave them with family and friends continually. Or, or to just give them up to others. Uh, this is your responsibility. The Bible is, is very plain. During the time when these little ones are, are small, they need mom at home. I'm so thankful 
um, that Ann was able to stay home with our children while they were young until they went into school age. Uh, it was a tremendous blessing to my children. She was a godly influence on them, and I know that it has a tremendous, uh, it's been a tremendous asset to them. It has been a life changer. This should be your responsibility and joy to love your children and take care of them. And now I understand, I will have to say something here. I understand there's single moms maybe single dads, and situations arrive that you have to send your little ones out for child care. That's understandable. God understands that. But if you can, if you, in other words, if you keep, if you want to send your wife out to work only so you can have a bigger house, better car, uh, nicer clothes, do more pleasures, whatever. Stop and think about that. This, your little children are valuable in the eyes of God. You know, I'm going to give you a little story. Aaron, our youngest one, when he was a senior in high school, he come to Ann and I and he said, uh, Dad, Mom, he said, would it be possible that you, that mom could stay home this, uh, my senior year here? I'd just like for her to be at home when I come home and so on. And he was in a private school, and very expensive, Modesto Christian, and we, we decided, well, we're going to have to go to the Lord in prayer about this. And so we did. We prayed about it, and finally we said, we, we felt, now God is really calling her to stay home this year. Aaron must be a Nathan <laughs> coming to us. And uh, so we did. We stepped out in faith. It didn't, it didn't pencil out by any stretch. But we decided by faith we would do that and honor his word. And so we did. And about, I think, within that week, little did I know that I had overpaid uh, good old Uncle Sam about $4,600, and that was almost exactly what our tuition was for that year. Isn't that amazing? Wasn't that God? Definitely. That was God. You know, Hannah was a godly influence on Samuel. Think of the impact that the mother of James and John made on their lives. Ponder the influence of Lois and Eunice in the young life of Timothy. Tremendous. Anne could have never made as much spaghetti and made as much homemade bread and salad and feed all the football players and the basketball players had she been working. <laughs> I mean, she made enough to feed an army. But in a very real sense, the old adage that says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world is very true, isn't it? How important that is. Mothers, you have a huge work at home. You really do to those little ones. Quoting Jay Adams, and I quote, he says, when Paul, this is his take, when Paul speaks to the fathers, he is speaking to the mothers. The reason he addresses the fathers is that the mothers do what the fathers are responsible for. In addressing the father, he is addressing the one in whom God has vested his authority for discipline and instruction. The father is the one who ultimately must answer to God for what happens in the home, end quote. Certainly, our wives are our most important resources in helping us raise our children, aren't they? Most definitely. God gave us our wife to be a suitable helper for this great task. Always hold your wife up, folks, men, husbands. Hold your wives up 
in high esteem before your children. Always. As one to be highly honored, respected, loved, and obeyed. You know, my kids, my boys, they, they, could, they could degrade me. They could call me names that, yeah, old dad would maybe take it. But boy, I'll tell you what, I better never ever hear them degrade or belittle their mother in front of me. That was never tolerated, not once. It's important, folks. Men, hold your wives up in high esteem before your little ones, before your children, before your teenagers. It's important. In the raising your children, you're a team. Your main goal is to properly bring them up in the Lord. Yes, it is father's responsibility. As we covered a couple weeks ago, it's a husband's responsibility to be the be over the home. He is the one, is the spiritual leader of the home, definitely. But the task is so great, the problems are so many, and the opposition is so strong that mutual effort and cooperation is very important here. And as I look back on raising my children, Ann and I, I think this is an area that I probably failed in uh, way too often. Because true unity needs to be involved here. We must be on the same page, us wives and our husbands, parents. Be together. What I mean is when there's discipline to be made, if my wife feels a certain way about how we should discipline or when we should discipline, and I feel another way, and we let that happen, the children become very confused, and they'll become angry, and they'll become bitter. I've seen that happen. You have to be on the same page. Sit down and pray together when there's discipline to be made so that your children understand exactly what you're expecting. Disunity in the raising of our children will result in failure. And we don't want that, do we? We want success. The Bible further states, but bring them up. In the Greek text, the verb translated bring up is in the active voice, an imperative mood, and present tense. The active voice shows us that children do not automatically grow up to be what God desires, do they? It doesn't just happen that way. This cannot happen because why? God says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, Proverbs 22, 15. And Vody Bachman says that they're just little vipers in diapers. <laughs> and yes, that's the truth. Uh, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. In Proverbs 29, 15, it says a child who gets his own way brings shame to who? His mother. If you as parents allow your children just complete freedom uh, to make all their own choices, do his own thing, the result will be shameful. It will come back in shame to us. In addition to the active voice, it is needful that the Greek verb is in the imperative mood. What does God say in Ephesians 6, 4? It's not just friendly advice. It's not just a suggestion. It's a command that God expects us to obey. The only way to raise our children to grow up to be Christians is through the Word of God, through Scripture. We cannot do, disobey this command. 
It is disobedience or rebellion against God, for he commands us to do so. It is imperative to bring them up. Finally, this verb is the present tense. Many times in our parenting we have said, I know that uh, the Lord says children are the heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. But Psalm, 20, Psalm 27, 3, but right now they sure don't seem like much of a reward. <laughs> They're just driving me up a wall. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could just take a break, hmm, sit back for a month or two, and let someone else just be in charge, correct them, raise them? Nope. God's Word says, no, you cannot do that. As long as children are in your home, you are constantly, persistently, totally bringing them up. As long as your children are under your care, every day will hold new opportunities to bring them up in the Lord. That's the key. As I have said, this is your job as parents, to bring your own children up. You're constantly involved. You're always on duty. And this should be one of your greatest joys. Why, for one thing, they grow up so quickly, and your time with them is really very limited. The time that you have to discipline and to teach and to instruct them in the Word of God is, is, is so brief. It's been 22 plus years that our last one at Aaron has left the nest. And uh, it seems like yesterday. Time, was, time just flew. When you get my age and you look back on it, you say, man, I wish I would have done things a bit different. Also, we are to bring them up, as I said, to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be our greatest desire. What a joy it is to see our children come to know him. Matthew 10, 14 says, let the children, little children, come to me, for such is the kingdom of God. We are to also teach them to be disciples of Christ. In Psalm 119, 9 through 11, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You want to keep your kids from sinning? Hide their, you know, the Word of God in their heart. Teach them to memorize Scripture while they're young. I can't tell you, uh, the Scriptures that I memorized when I was 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, they have stuck. They're there. But it's difficult as we get older to be able to put them there and, and make them stay there. <laughs> I, now I try to memorize scripture and I read it and I read it and I read it and five minutes later, it's gone. <laughs> I don't know where it went. <laughs> but our greatest desire should be to bring children up to know Jesus Christ, to live for Jesus Christ, and to lead them to mature in Jesus Christ. We should prepare our children to leave the home nest and to fly successfully for themselves. We, as parents, are called to bring our children up and to prepare them so they can be independent to when the time comes for them to leave home they're prepared. They're ready. Only Christ and only your teaching 
can prepare them for this great task. By all means, God says, avoid provoking our children to anger, as we've seen. How do we avoid this from happening? This is rather topical, but I'm going to offer about eight suggestions here that I think, that I've seen from my own life that has maybe been helpful. And we'll back it by God's word, of course. First, in a negative way, God says we must avoid provoking our children to anger. One of the great cross-references we find here is a phrase found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, when he says, Fathers, uh, do not exasperate your children, or irritate, or provoke, or do not be too hard on them, or harass them, depending on, again, translations, lest they be discouraged and frustrated. Do not break their spirit. The NASB translate these same, this same verse, do not exasperate your children, or they may lose heart. Uh, that's the last thing we want to do, is to bring our children up in, and raise our children in such a way uh, that is too harsh, or that we exasperate them, or we cause them to lose heart, or we cause them to, to, to break their spirit. Break their pride, yes, but not their spirit. Um, if we raise our children in such a way like that, they may become cast down, bitter, hostile, lazy, resentful, ungodly, and wayward young people. And I've seen this happen many, many families where the, the, the dad mainly uh, many times, or the mother at times, were too rigid. They were, were too strict, too hard on them, come down uh, too, too hard. And what happened? The child became bitter. The child became hostile or lazy. He was confused. We don't want to do that. That's not according to Scripture. Second, we must not expect more of our children than what they're able to give. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 tell us? It says, when I was a child, Paul says, I spoke as a child and I thought as a child, understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. But let's remember, in disciplining or instructing our children, we're to do, do so in patience, realizing that they're children. They don't react or react like adults. They can't. They're still children. They're little guys. We've got a lot of little ones here this morning, young, young little guys, and, and I'm so thankful for that. You, you, parents, uh, sometimes I almost envy you, really. <laughs> what a blessing you've got. Yeah, it's a, do, would I want to go back and do this over again? I don't think so. <laughs> but, you know, it's really probably one of the happiest times in your life. It really is. You say, oh, Bruce, you're, you're just getting old. You're losing it, man. <laughs> but, no, it really is. It should be one of the most exciting and joyful times in your life. But be patient with these little ones. Third, we need to be careful how we correct them, and we covered that somewhat there. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Boy, we've all seen that, haven't we? You know, if, if a child gets mad and he throws something or he hollers at dad or mom and, and we, we get mad back and we start hollering, before you know, you're just in a, a yelling fest, aren't you? And, and, and that never is good. It just stirs more anger. But I remember some, I can remember back when my children did something 
you know, wrong, and, and they would holler or whatever, and if I just come up to them and say, now, oh, dear, let's look at it this way, it would be amazing what, what would change their heart and their attitude. Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, and slander be put away from you. Do not call your children names like, uh, oh, you dummy, or you're stupid, or... You knucklehead. I mean, I, we've all done it. I know I have. And, and I'm, not, I'm not happy about that. I, I, but but it, we shouldn't do that. That's, that belittles our children. It degrades them. Let's be more available to praise them rather than to tear them down. Let's praise them and build them up. And always tell them that you're sorry when you do fail or when you blow it. And, and like I said, we've all blown it. And my uh, middle son called me a couple years ago on Father's Day, uh, Joseph, and he said, uh, he said, Dad, I just want to call and tell you I love you and that I really appreciate all the many things that you did bringing me up in the Lord. And I said, Joe, I really appreciate that. I really do. But I said, boy, I, I, I'm sorry that I, I didn't always <laughs> treat you the way I should have, the way the Bible teaches me. I, I got angry at times and, and frustrated. And, and he said, you know, Dad, he said, uh, the thing about it was you always, he said, I cannot even remember a time where when you didn't blow it, yes, you blew it, but when you did, you always came and you asked for forgiveness and you confessed your fault to me. And I forgave you and it's done. I don't even remember it. I said, thanks, Joe. That meant a lot to me. And so I'm saying, if, if your child, um, if you fail in instructing them, if you fail in disciplining them, just go to them and ask forgiveness. They'll forgive you. They're very resilient that way. Fourth, we must practice what we preach. We must avoid double standards or hypocrisy. Kids can read through that like a book. Philippians 4.9 says, What you have learned, received, heard, and seen in me Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's always live what we preach. Let's don't tell them one thing and go out and do another. That will totally confuse them. Fifth, we ought to build in the minds of our children the proper values and standards and we said by precepts. Our society today has made idols, haven't they, of power, of wealth, of strength, of beauty, of intelligence, athletic ability, and their list could go on and on. But you know, if your child does not possess some of these abilities, in the eyes of the world, they're told they're unsuccessful. And we have to be careful as parents, don't we? That we don't belittle our children. If, if they aren't athletic or they aren't the most intelligent, we need to come alongside them and help them and look on the inside. God's Word teaches us to look on the inside, not on the outside of a person. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord sees, not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Let's look on the heart of our child. You might be surprised what you see there. A lot of beauty. Sixth, we should seek to have good times with our children. Build up many happy experiences with your kids. I spent many hours in the basketball court of our backyard uh, shooting baskets. Of course, that was something that I loved. 
I played basketball in Ohio, and I, my kids kind of just naturally uh, followed that. But if I had a dime for every basket I shot with my boys there, I'd be a billionaire probably. Our oldest son, Gordon, um, he's 50 years old now, and he used to love, uh, he, he, he would keep everything inside. He, he was one who was very private with his feelings. And, but I could get him out in the basketball court at night, and he would open up. He would talk to me about everything. Uh, what was bothering him, he talked, we could talk about the Lord. Uh, it was amazing. I wouldn't miss that for anything. And I remember the many hours of shopping at the mall with my daughter. Yeah, I said shopping. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it was something that she loved. So, we, you know, like daughters do, when she was a teenager, in 10th, 11th, 12th years in high school, we would go shopping at the mall and we didn't always buy. We'd go on a date and we'd eat and then have a little, you know, she'd buy some shoes or a purse or something. And, and, but there again, spend time with your kids. I guarantee that the time that you spent with them will come back many, many, many times over in blessing to your life. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine. But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Laugh with your kids. Have fun with them. They need that and you need that. Seventh, freely tell them often that you love them and appreciate them. 1 Corinthians 16, 4 says, let all be done in love. Everything we do. 1 John is full of love one another. He's speaking of the body of Christ, but yes, we are to love one another. But we're to love our children. Say to them, tell them those three little words, I love you. They need to hear those things. They really do. It means so much to a child when you just say, I love you. An eighth, allow your children to fail, to make mistakes without making them feel like they are unaccepted unless they are perfect in what they do. Ephesians 4.12 says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Home must be a safe haven for your child. It must be a place where they are, when they are discouraged, that they, you listen to them, you care about them, and above all, praise them often. Praise them often. Ninth, admit your mistakes to them. Ask forgiveness when you fail and seek reconciliation. We covered that earlier. But James 5.16 tells us to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There is healing there. If we can are free to confess our faults with our children, it will be easier for them to approach us when they fail us or when they have problems or when they fail the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be easier for them to come and confess to, them, to Him. Listen to your children. Let them share their interests with you. And sometimes it may not always be the most suitable hour. My teenagers, uh, Stephanie, for one, comes to to mind, she, for some reason, she would get home, her, her uh, curfew was about 11 o'clock in the evening. Well, she'd come home from a date or just being out that night, and, and she would come sneaking in 
But she would always, she'd come, but she, her bedroom was down the hall, past hours. But for some reason, she'd always stop and she would knock on the door, you know, real quietly. And she said, Dad, Mom, are you awake? Uh, well, we weren't, but we are now. <laughs> and she would settle in the end of bed. She said, can, can we talk? I, well, yeah, sure, staff, let's go. Yeah. And, and she would uh, start to talk. And she would talk, and she would talk, and she would talk. <laughs> and sometimes for an hour, hour and a half, and, you know, I had to get up about 5 o'clock the next morning and go to work, but it, that's okay. My daughter was talking with us. She was telling us all kinds of things. You know, maybe she'd been on a date, and she wanted to share with us different things, and, and she did. And, and I, I wouldn't take those times back for nothing. And it seemed like all our kids. Now we got our grandkids that do it. We was down to Aaron's not long ago, and, and Austin and, and Ava come in at about 5 o'clock in the morning, and they want to talk. And so now they're talking with us. And then Annika and Aiden shows up. We got a whole room full of talkers. And, but you know what? Let kids talk. They, they want to share. Whenever they want to share, uh, listen to them. In verse 4b, he says, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. The Greek word translated discipline and instruction actually means to put in the mind or to put on the mind. So basically it is saying parents are to bring your children up by placing something in or on their minds. What is it that we want to place on their hearts? It's by placing God's word on their hearts. Spend time teaching them the Bible. Read from them the Bible. From the earliest years, just a little time each day even. Get them in the habit of just sitting down and, and reading the word together. And worship. Uh, we spent time teaching our children. We usually tried to do it in the evenings, especially when they were younger, when they got older. You know, sometimes it didn't always suit. They had other plans and so on and so forth. But we tried to have worship and Bible reading with our children. And I have to share something here, though. Uh, when I read the Bible or or we was uh, encouraging in the word, or we was having worship, I was way too rigid. I, I would say, you know, I want them to sit up straight and um, to be quiet and to listen. Dear old dad's speaking here. You wanna, he's giving instruction. You want to listen. But, you know, it was a great idea, but bad method. And my loving wife said, dear, she said, uh, if the kids want to lay on the floor, if they want to stand on their head, let them. They're hearing the Word of God. Don't worry. Don't fret the small stuff. And after that, things went much easier. Just be faithful and read the Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time singing with your kids. It's so important. It really is. Get them to love the Word of God. J. Adams has said that this means a child must be reached in his heart with God's Word. It is this message that speaks of a loving Lord who came and gave himself for his people, which first must touch our children's hearts, bringing them to repentance and faith. Parents must lead them to a repentance, lead them to conviction of sin, and bring them to the calling of their Savior, end quote. God shows us many truths, doesn't he, in his word. He tells us about God and man, about sin and salvation, about heaven and hell, about creation and providence, 
about regeneration, redemption, justification, repentance, faith, sanctification, and a host of other doctrines. You know, I think children do need to understand as they get older, especially some of these major doctrines, like they need to understand what redemption, justification, repentance, faith, and sanctification. They need to understand what those mean and explain to them. Uh, parents, it is your responsibility and privilege to share with your children these things. Um, the stakes work, though. It doesn't just happen. You have to get in, dig in the Word, and, and get out your dictionaries and, and put in the work. But if you need help, ask for help. We elders and pastors are here to help in any way that we can to encourage. The Bible is also a guide in it in our everyday life and for our children. It tells us how to relate and get along with others, how to control and use our emotions, how to solve problems, how to make decisions, how to use our time and our money, how to work, how to pray, how to study the Bible. The answer to every question that a child has we find in the Word of God. It is our grand privilege to share these things with our kids, with our children. It is the scripture, by the scriptures, that men are made into salvation through Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16a 3, says that all scripture is God-breathed. It's all inspired. Romans 10.17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. It is by scripture that we are, in, as 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 says, we are taught, we're reproved, corrected, trained in righteousness, and mature and thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's means and ways of saving our children and making them mature in Jesus Christ is through discipline and instruction of the Lord from his word. I know today this has been probably mostly topical. I usually don't preach topically. But I felt like there's just a lot of areas here that we trust it's been straight from the word as well. But you know, we have seen basically, that we are not to provoke or exasperate our children to anger, but we are to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I'm going old school. How? In the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. We have seen through God's word and by much application. I believe I can speak for Brother Cameron that it has been our joyful and humble privilege to preach this series on marriage. Because we are living in such, um, I don't know, it seems like almost every day we hear of something new that our culture is changing or leaning to. If we're not living in Romans 1 type age, I don't know when it is. But we've seen God's purposes, God's sovereignty, and God's design for marriage. Cameron told us that it is for one man and one woman for one lifetime or until death do you part. That's God's design. We know but because of the sin, that's not always the case. Then we saw a responsibility as husbands that we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. 
and gave himself up for her. Or in love our own bodies as ourselves. And then we saw, as Cameron spoke the biblical role of a wife. He spoke of the lovely act of submission that a wife has to her husband. What a blessing and joy that is for the home. And today, we're looking at the parents' role and responsibility of raising children according to the Lord's word, to God's word. And I trust that this series will have improved our marriages and our understanding of God's word on marriage and will make a positive impact for good on our marriages here at RHC. That's our desire. We want to see our marriages grow strong in the Lord. That's really, there's nothing that we want to see more as pastors and elders here is to see our marriages grow strong in the Lord. And we can do this by God's word, can't we? By God's word and his word alone. Not by culture. Not by others' opinions. But by God's word. In closing, I found an excerpt of one Christian father who I identified with. And I quote, my family is all grown up and the kids are all gone. But if I had it to do over again, this is what I would do. I would love my wife more in front of my children. I would laugh more with them, more at our mistakes and our joys. I would listen more even to the littlest child. I would be more honest about my own weaknesses never pretending perfection. I would pray differently for my family. Instead of focusing on them, I would focus on me. I would do more things together with my children. I would encourage them more and bestow more praise. I would pay more attention to the little things like deeds and words of thoughtfulness. And then finally, if I had it to do all over again, I would share God's word more faithfully, more intimately with my family. Every ordinary thing that happened in every ordinary day, I would use to direct them God. 